The mistake a lot of my colleagues make is thinking that if you've got a very good idea, you've got a very good piece of technology, you've got a great new idea for redesigning systems, that people will thank you for it. And if it's really good, you just have to pitch up somewhere and people will flock to you. The reality, as we all know, is different. If you build a field of dreams, actually very few people, if any, come. Um, and that's what happens in the NHS. In fact, we know it takes over 16 years to take a product from good idea uh, through to at-scale deployment. And that actually happened with something as fundamental as penicillin, the first antibiotic. So, in Scotland, we are looking at things differently. What we are saying is that bottom-up innovation is fundamentally important for sustainability, but actually it does not work alone. You actually need top-down as well as bottom-up. What I mean by that? Well, we actually need government policy that is both consistent but clear. So in a Scottish perspective, uh, we have got legislation in place that is making us and I use the word making intentionally, integrate health and social care. It actually has been possible for us to work in an integrated way across health and social care for the last five, seven, ten years, but very few, if anybody, did it. The only way it's actually happening is because of the legislation. But what that has meant, it's actually changed the rules of the game. Because you've then got to look to see how you critically redesign your health and care systems to work in an integrated way. And for us, it's how you use technologies, how you use digital tools and techniques to actually be the cement that builds that innovation, both the foundation of it, because the foundation of it is about data, it's about information, it's data transferring with the individual, be it the patient or the service user, between organisations, and then it's about other digital tools that can improve the efficiency of your processes, but equally importantly in the world that we inhabit today, the effectiveness of our staff. And the key point for us is giving the citizen control over that whole process. Now, nothing else can do that but working innovatively and also employing digital tools. The issue of information governance is really, really fantastic for me because there are more urban myths about information governance restrictions and probably I've had hot dinners and you can see I've had a lot of hot dinners. The reality is when you dig beneath the surface, there are very few barriers for us sharing information with the individual. In fact, we should be saying that, in fact, the information belongs to the individual and the individual gives permission to the system to use it. That actually is our reality. So particularly senior clinicians use it as a form of shroud waving to block progress and block things happening. Now, it's not actually that they want to block progress. It is actually the fear of the unknown rather than an actual intention to not move forward. We need to understand that. But for me, it's also not about giving the patient all of their information. Because 99% of the population of the UK, as well as most of Europe, are not actually interested in their health record. They're interested in some parts of their health record, and the parts that they're interested in changes at different periods of their lives. So, for example, in Estonia, where it's a well-connected system and the whole health record is available to the citizens, the most common group of the population that access it are pregnant women and the things they look for are their scan results. Why? Because they want to see a picture of the baby and they want to share it with their friends and they want to look at their blood results to make sure they're not low in iron. So you can see at different stages of your life you're interested in different things. So that's for me what's important, it's the person-centred component. So when you're thinking about making the health record available, make sure you make it available in a way that addresses the requirements of the population. And a lot of places where the electronic health record has been opened up, it's been done under the aegis of clinicians thinking it's the right thing to do, rather than citizens telling them what they want. So I'm not saying we shouldn't open it up, I believe we should, but we have to make sure it's configurable. Because you don't want citizens to be 
wasting time by going through reams and reams of things they don't actually want to see or don't wholly understand. Allow them to upload onto their own personal health space, however you configure that, the bits of information they want at the time that is relevant for them. Innovation is the buzzword of 2015, um, but actually a lot of people don't understand what innovation actually is and certainly not what it means in day-to-day -day functioning. For me and for far too long, and I'm towards the end of my medical career now, and sadly I have made mistakes the whole way through, both as a clinician and over the last 15 to 20 years as a senior manager, and managing and designing and delivering fairly complex health and care systems. And the mistake I, I learned was that we thought in healthcare in particular, we not only had to own the problem, we actually had to own the solution. And that is incredibly wasteful. We didn't actually ask the people what they want. So that's point one. Your main partner, the future survival of the health and care system in the UK and beyond is not in the hands of healthcare professionals or managers or entrepreneurs. It's with the citizens, the people who will be using the service. So involve them from day one. But also it's a partnership and it's a partnership with health and care delivery professionals, but equally with academia and industry. And you have to have a safe space where you can bring all those key players together in a safe and constructive environment where you can work together to articulate the problems and let those with the skills develop the solutions in a way that doesn't compromise one organisation, one individual, or create opportunities, particularly for industry, to make money out of the solution at the end of the day. So in Scotland, we have developed a number of innovation centres, one in stratified medicines, one in big data, and another in digital health and care, and that's the one I know most about. And we spent the first six months working out with the legal teams, the issues about procurement, how you don't disadvantage industry from being part of those initial conversations. Because what was fascinating was that industry were worried about getting involved in the ground floor, that if it eventually came to procurement, they would be barred from making money uh, out of, of whatever came out of the, the dialogue. But interesting, the public se se sector, the NHS in the UK uh, terms, they were terrified about being part of either, in case they were tainted in some way with industry and gave them competitive advantage. So by spending the time to get all those legal things both understood and articulated, you could create a safe environment for interaction where the citizens and the health professionals or the care professionals could articulate the problem and the academics working in partnership with industry could come up with the solutions. You can kick the tires on it. If it's going to fail, fail fast with little cost, redesign and go again. And that's how we are approaching innovation. No one has got a magic wand. No one's got the panacea. If anyone can tell me how to scale up innovation, it'll be the first one in the world and they will be multimillionaires overnight. But that doesn't mean we should stop trying. SBRI, from the TSB point of view, are pre-commercial procurement. We are using a lot of um, a European, not a lot, uh, a number of European projects we've got into, really so we can learn about how, how to procure across European member states. Because the other thing for me is that with the shortage of money within all public services, we need to work smarter together. So at the moment we're in a project with Catalonia and the region of South Denmark and we're procuring a, an app for, a mobile app for the management of cardiac failure. Is that going to be groundbreaking? Absolutely no way. I mean, you could build a bloody app tomorrow for that. It's actually learning how three regions can procure a single product, playing to each region's strength and levering that advantage. And we need to work smarter together. So we've talked about across industry, academia, public sector and, and service users. But actually, we need to work across international boundaries if we really want to be serious and crack this problem. Wales is a very good size for doing something at scale. Scotland the same. Scotland's got 5.3 million. So it's a good size. England will have to look to its construct. Now, what England did was it fragmented its NHS into component parts that actually are too small at this moment in time. It needs 
to build back up to a regional kind of level. And it needs to give those regions permission to innovate. Now, the other thing we have within the UK, but it's actually no different to insurance-based systems, is that the one surefire way for a chief executive in a healthcare business to lose their job is if something fails. Now, we actually all know that innovation, failure is a fundamental and core part of innovation. So you've got to be able to allow people to fail. But as I've said before, fail fast and do it in a safe environment. And then it becomes okay to fail. But culturally, it is a really difficult thing, particularly for our chief executive cohort in the UK, in the public sector, to get their head around.